Hello, I'm Michael DiPietro. I'm a pediatric radiologist at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and a professor of radiology and pediatrics. Today I'm going to talk to you about the ultrasound of the pediatric hip, including the painful hip and uh, developmental dysplasia of the hip. I have no disclosures. And let's begin. We're going to talk about the painful hip and also about developmental dysplasia of the hip. The objectives for the painful hip are, as you can read here, um, ma majority of it involving joint effusion, but also other causes of painful and irritable hip. Objectives regarding developmental dysplasia of the hip are, as you can read here, to get an overview and concepts and orientation and learning how to avoid some pitfalls. The child with the painful hip. There are uh, several causes and we'll touch on uh, some of these. Sometimes he actually says that the hip hurts, sometimes you only know it because the child won't move it or will manifest with a limp. And always remember that sometimes hip pathology because of referred plane actually is experienced as knee pain or as the problem really is in the hip. So a few tips. Um, talking about hip joint effusion, in contrast to uh, other joints uh, such as the, the elbow and the, the ankle and the knee, you, it's really difficult to detect a, a, a joint effusion when it's in the hip. And therefore, we really rely on sonography. Uh, plain radiographs are not reliable. So we're going to be talking about uh, one issue is uh, how can you possibly tell if the effusion is septic arthritis versus a more benign entity, transient synovitis of the hip. Uh, sonography is certainly useful to detect the fluid, but differentiating between those two diagnoses, which is an important differentiating to make, we're going to see what can we tell based on the uh, sonog sonographic findings, what can we tell perhaps based on some clinical data. So our, our mission really with sonography is to identify the fusion and in some cases use sonographic guidance for aspirating it. I'll just mention a bit about that, but we're not going to talk a lot about the technique of um, joint aspiration. Basically, you want to have the, uh, the patient's hip in this position. Now, sometimes because of the pain, the child is going to, is going to determine uh, him or herself what position the hip is going to be in. And one thing is important to remember is that if you do comparison images of the other side, uh, you want to make sure that you match the position so that uh, you're comparing apples with apples. But if you can, uh, you like to have it uh, rotated as, as noted here and abducted and extended. Uh, this is a, a picture. You can tell it's an older one by the size of the transducer from a colleague, Dr. Harkey. But you're showing how the patient is supine, and you're following an, an anterior approach to look at the hip effusion. This anterior approach is in contradistinction to the approach that we're going to talk about later when we talk about developmental dysplasia of the hip. Here's a similar type picture, but in a small baby, and it's showing you how you're, you're coming from the front. You're in a long axis relative to the femur. And as you can see in this diagram, that you're, you're matching the, um, the long axis of the femoral neck. Notice also, and we'll see a few more pictures, that the joint space uh, actually extends quite a way down on the, uh, on the femoral neck. And we're really relying that. The upper right picture is uh, an arthrogram with, uh, with contrast. And you can see that the hip joint isn't just up here, but the, it extends down to here. And that's really what you see on this long axis on the sonogram. So what does it look like? Well, you, you, what you'll see is that the fluid in front of the femoral neck causes the, uh, the joint capsule to distend, as in this diagram with convex anteriorly. This is the psoas muscle across the top of it. Um, in this radiograph, which is actually this child, there was a little bit of widening of this space, which could suggest uh, that there is a joint effusion, but that is very unreliable. 
Um, these are some criteria that are used, but mainly I think what most of us rely on is seeing this convexity and then seeing it uh, more of a, a convex appearance in the side that hurts rather than on the asymptomatic side, which would have more of this sort of appearance here. So here's a normal, and in all of these long axis, uh, superior is towards your left as you view these, and here's the femoral neck, and this is the uh, joint space on the normal side, and notice how it's bowed forward, and it's uh, with this anterior convexity because of the effusion. The overlying psoas muscle is seen here and here. Now, a couple of things I can throw you off, especially dealing with children, is, is cartilage being hypoechoic, can be confused sometimes with, with the hypochoic or anechoic fluid. So in this picture, we're actually quite high, and there's the cartilaginous labrum of the, uh, of the hip joint, and here's cartilage over the femoral head. So don't confuse that. The labrum is not the effusion. And here's a picture without the markers on it. The cartilage of the femoral head is not the effusion. Here's another one. And you're going to see in a moment, this is more prominent in children because they have much more cartilage than this. This is the effusion down over the femoral neck. And here's a picture. It's a small one in this case, not as bowed as the other case was. But that's where you look for the effusion. And in cases where you're going to aspirate it, that's where you go is down here. If you try to get into this space up here, you're going to hit the labrum and you're not going to get in. So this is, this is, this is really where pay dirt is at the femoral neck. So again, comparing the two sides, we always like to have the two hips in the same position, same amount of rotation. This is a small effusion here, no effusion here. Uh, this is a, a picture from colleague Dr. Harkey, and this is a child, so there's actually much more cartilage than we saw in the other examples. And there can even be more if the child is even younger and there's left ossification of the femoral head. And you do not want to confuse this with effusion. This is just cartilage over the head. Another finding which you'll sometimes see is here. And some people look at this and think this, oh, there, you know, there's debris in the joint space. But it isn't. This is just a, a posterior reflection of the synovium. And this was well described some years ago uh, from, uh, by Dr. Robin et al. So basically, you, you come from an anterior approach. And uh, now we want to talk about, you, you have shown that there's an effusion. Is there any way we can tell if it's septic, i.e. bacterial infection, or, or not? Now, here's two examples. The, ones, the, the left side over here is normal. This side is bowed. And not only is it bowed, but the capsule is very thick. And there's a lot of echogenic uh, debris within, this, uh, within the fluid. And uh, you would be a good bet that this is a, a, a septic effusion, and indeed it was. Uh, as you can see, there was actually pus in the joint. Uh, they all do not look like this, though. For instance, here's a case where the right side's here, and this is long axis, and now for the first time I'm showing you short axis. That there's a, really the effusion is very small on this left side. It also looks anechoic, but because of clinical reasons, it ended up, it was tapped, and it, 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 was a, it was a septic hip, even though there was a small amount of fluid. So, so the size of the effusion doesn't really uh, rule out the fact that it could be a septic hip. Also, the fact that it's anechoic doesn't rule it out, and that there's no thickening of the capsule does not rule it out. So based on those sonographic findings that we just described that sometimes works but not always, as you saw in the second example, basically the sonographic findings are nonspecific regarding whether or not it's, it's uh, septic. Um, with the advent of power Doppler in the late uh, 1990s, we thought that maybe this could help us to, to sort it out and certainly help our clinical colleagues who are seeing the patient often in the emergency department setting so we had a clinical series where we followed uh, numerous uh, sequential patients being evaluated for hip joint effusion and also an animal model that we had. And basically the conclusion that we came to in both of them is that uh, when you saw it, uh, a, a big difference, uh, you, you saw a very positive response on the power Doppler uh, in this clinical setting that it, it was going to be septic. However, uh, 
the sensitivity was not perfect because we had some um, patients and also some rabbits that uh, were falsely negative and we think it was because it was early in the septic process. So you have to be careful of that. So if it's positive, uh, it's a good sign that you're dealing with a septic hip uh, in this clinical scenario. And if it's negative, it still could be if it's early in the course. Now again, there are other causes of a power Doppler being positive. For instance, the patient could have another cause for uh, a joint inflammation such as uh, an arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, etc. But that's a different clinical presentation. And then here's from the clinical series, and you can see uh, uh, this was just felt to be transient synovitis on the left. And usually what we do is we, we look at the normal side and we make our settings that we start to get a signal on power, use the same settings, go to the other side, and we look to see if it lights up. And in this case it didn't, in this case it did. Here's where we set our, our, our um, settings on the asymptomatic normal side. This side, which incidentally also has a very echogenic effusion, really lit up considerably, and this was a septic hip. In the uh, rabbit model, uh, this was pretty typical. We had we used the knee uh, instead of the hip. It was easier, but uh, you can see that in those in whom we produced uh, uh, sterile effusions, we saw this. Those that had uh, septic effusions, we saw this, but we did have a few that did not have all this reaction. And again, it was earlier in the course. Um, some hours later, the next day when we scanned them again, they did look like this. So here's the summary that uh, power Doppler can help, uh, especially if it's positive. If it isn't, you haven't entirely excluded the possibility of a septic hip. So sonography is not perfect. And there's our summary. Looking at other uh, things, and, and this is a paper now uh, from the late 90s, um, but, uh, and, and there's been some other work looking at this, but basically it's looking at the clinical criteria, and, and you can read these here, and basically the way it came out was that if all f four of these factors, and then another paper from University of Michigan added C-reactive protein, if all of these are positive and acutely to painful, hip with an effusion, it's almost guaranteed that that's going to be a septic hip. If all of these are negative and the kid with a painful hip with an effusion, it's probably going to be transient synovitis. Uh, the kid with the uh, with all positive and high likely to have a septic hip is probably going to go straight to the operating room because they don't. you don't only need to have the hip aspirated, but it has to be washed out and thoroughly cleaned out. However, in the kid where a couple of these factors are positive but the others aren't, then, then you're, you're sort of in between whether you're going to have it or not. And that's the case where uh, perhaps actually doing a joint aspiration can be helpful to then decide what should be done. So there are still some cases where you really want to aspirate the joint. Uh, just to show you how you do it, you basically want to use your son sonography. You want to get a target over the neck, again, not up here. And then you come right down on that and, and uh, hopefully get into the space. Now, there are other things that can affect uh, the, the hip and cause hip pain. So we want to be careful. We, we really want to be focused on what we're doing, but you don't want to have tunnel vision. You want to look around and see other things. And here are a few examples that we're going to see. Psoas abscess is, is well known as a, as a cause. It's, again, a case from Dr. Harkey, and, and you can see that there's no effusion. But the overlying psoas muscle looked um, a little abnormal and hypoechoic. And then now I'm just going to go back and forth to a CT, and you can see that there's a, a lot of these big fluid. This is all an abscess that's involving the psoas. And actually, here it is going up and up at the groin, and you could also see it on the ultrasound. And here it is right over the ilia, up into the pelvis, the iliopsoas, and here it is here. So certainly sonography can, can make the diagnosis. Uh, sometimes the advantage of CT or MR is that you get a more panoramic global view. But you certainly, uh, especially if your first line of attack is ultrasound, you want to be mindful that uh, there could be more going on than just the joint. So you want to look around a little bit. Another example we had was, was this child who came in with with pain and the radiographs were not remarkable. And uh, even on the ultrasound, uh, there was a convexity on this side, the side that hurt, 
not on this side for comparison. So there wasn't a fusion there. There's some debris in it. But in looking around, the soft tissues didn't look right. They, they were more echogenic. And this is a child who actually had overlying uh, myositis. And then when they really looked uh, uh, more around the leg and, and over around the thigh, the tissue planes were all uh, abnormal with all this echogenicity and increased vascularity. Now look at this in contrast to the other side where the, the planes are very nicely maintained from subcutaneous to muscle, but on this side, it's, they're very disturbed. So this is a kid, and besides having the effusion, also had uh, myositis. This is it in short axis. You can see the two sides in comparison, which are muscles here and, and how it's all very swollen, distorted, etc. And in this movie loop, uh, as you're going down the leg, you can see the, uh, the, the myositis quite dramatically. And also there was some suggestion that there might actually be some um, uh, subperiosteal fluid, which when you see that, that's an indication that you might actually also be dealing with osteomyelitis. Another case, this is a child that I actually I saw in the emergency department, and we didn't know this history at the time that you can see here about neuroblastoma. Had an effusion, and we went down, and we did the sonography, and we saw a small effusion, but the kid's pain really seemed to be out of proportion to that. So we, we looked a little higher, and actually he was kind of pointing that it did bother him up a little bit more uh, towards the pelvis. So we, we scanned up in that area, and lo and behold, what do we find as we're going up into the pelvis? This is long axis. The hip joint is, is way down here. There's this, this mass that we're seeing. And then this is it in short axis. And actually, uh, uh, so we told him that there's a mass. Later on, we learned, but no one had told us, that he had been treated for neuroblastoma a few years ago. And actually, what this ended up being was a recurrence. Uh, probably from a drop metastasis that went down and settled and started growing on the psoas. And the effusion in the hip joint was probably reactive to the psoas irritation. A few other hip uh, cases where uh, sonography is not really the, the main way we look for slip capital femoral epiphysis, but this is a case that my colleague, uh, Dr. Sanchez, uh, did. And uh, they were suspicious of that diagnosis, that clinical story was right, but the radiographs were not very convincing. So he performed sonography, and here's the normal side, and it's very, very subtle. See how the epiphysis is offset a few millimeters from the metaphysis. So here it lines up. And this ended up being a very subtle, very early left slip capital femoral epiphysis. Uh, the child ended up having the, uh, the uh, femoral head pinned, which is the treatment uh, to prevent further slippage. Another one where there was a child and, and th there was pain and there was a finding that was suspicious that it could be a subtle fracture on the radiograph. And again, when doing sonography, uh, you could see on the abnormal side that there's a rent there as compared to this side. This is a little bit distal to where the, uh, the hip joint ends down in the femoral neck. And then there's some echogenic material here, which is probably uh, some, some hematoma, but there was a subtle uh, fracture. So again, uh, sonography is not generally the first line of attack for fractures, but certainly if you have it, you don't want to miss it. And there could be some subtle cases where it can really uh, help you out. And here it is in short axis with the little buckle fracture that we're seeing right here. So that concludes so far this part about the, uh, the, the painful hip, and these are the things that, that we covered. Now to move on to developmental dysplasia of the hip, this is what you want to prevent. Uh, this is a kid, and they didn't realize it. Now at this age, he's going to be presenting with a, with a limp uh, because effectively one leg is shorter than the other because the hip's out of the joint. And so the goal is, is to miss this. And uh, this... Uh, this saying, which no one really knows where this came from, but it's been around for a while. Uh, it's kind of apropos for, for this situation. And of course, uh, developmental displays of the hip that is missed is, is a major cause of litigation in the United States. So your main reason for not missing it is for the benefit of the child, but there's, there's also a secondary that you, there can be a lot of legal issues involved with it when you do miss it. 
we're going to uh, discuss some practical tips and also some uh, pitfalls. Why and when do you do it? Well, I'm not going to really discuss that as much. That's been covered in the literature very well by, again, my our, uh, pediatric radiology colleagues, Dr. Harkey, um, who's very well known. Karen Rosendahl in, in Norway has done some incredible uh, public health type, stu type studies and basically involving uh, all the newborns of Norway and being able to follow them over the years. And I'd encourage you to look up their papers and you can see more about it. Uh, in the United States, basically, uh, everyone is not screened for DDH, but if you have a, either an abnormal physical examination with a click or a clunk, or if you have a risk factor, and major risk factors are being breached, um, other problems like torticollis or club foot, which suggests that perhaps there was some elegant uh, element of a, a packing of the child in utero or some, some constraint of motion or perhaps oligodramnios, uh, any risk factors, and then we'll go ahead and we'll scan them. We're going to talk about the orientation, which is very important, and static and dynamic aspects of the study. The term developmental dysplasia of the hip years ago used to be called congenital dislocated hip, but that was stopped because they're not all dislocated and certainly not all dislocated at birth. But it is kind of a spectrum, as you can read here, of, of different uh, forms of presentation. And within this, you have to be careful that when you're studying a baby uh, soon after birth, that there's going to be some laxity, which is going to correct itself probably, which is normal. It's called physiologic laxity. So you don't want to overread that. Um, basically, uh, for, for, for many years, it was a bit of people would say, what school do you follow? The more morphology static school of Dr. Graf here from Austria, an orthopedic surgeon, or the more dynamic study, uh, Dr. Harkey from the United States, um, a, um, a, a pediatric radiologist, who basically adapted the physical examination and looked at it with ultrasound. Um, they actually did formally come to an agreement, as you can see back here in the 1990s, uh, most of us were doing combinations of the both all along anyhow, but, uh, but those are certainly two parts um, of the study. I think they're both very important. So orientation and technique are critical. Um, slide from a colleague, Dr. Schlesinger, now at Texas Children's, just showing uh, uh, how you might do a, 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 the coronal technique. Now, uh, as you'll see later, we don't scan this way with the hand so far from the baby, but this was done to show transducer placement. And you can see this is long axis to the body, and, uh, and we'll see in a moment how this is going to give you a view that is very similar to an AP radiograph of the hip. And we'll kind of use that to, to help fix it in your mind what we're seeing. So. We'll be sharing some tips for doing the study, also for teaching it, and also for explaining it uh, to the parents. And I think that's, that's very important. Um, and I've had some parents, you know, say they, they were very appreciative of understanding, you know, what we were seeing and why was the test, you know, ordered by their doctor, etc. So in this little drawing I did years ago, uh, you can see uh, what you see on a radiograph and the blank spots here is because much of the bone is cartilage, so it does not show up on the radiograph, but does on the ultrasound. So this is our coronal view. You can see you have labrum or you have the uh, uh, unossified um, acetabular roof. The lab the tr Sometimes this is entirely called the labrum. The true labrum is the tip of it, the fibrocartilage, and also hyaline cartilage of the head and the greater trochanter. A hip is a ball in a socket, and that's actually this is the key to the exam. This is the way I explain it to the parents and to residents. You want to make sure the ball is the ball in the socket. That's the location. Does it stay in the socket with the, uh, with the stress maneuvers and the physical examination? And is the socket well formed? And you can see this is a more a well formed, normal, mature um, socket or acetabulum. And this is a more immature dysplastic one. And usually the, the parents uh, catch on to this pretty quickly, and it, and it, and it helps uh, for them to understand what's happening. So this is the, the way we really do scan them more. And, and actually an overall technique in, in scanning and, and sonography of children is I really like to have my hand on the child. 
because the kid can be a moving target, the kid can move around. Uh, so I actually have there, and really my hand cradles the transducer in, in, in other parts of the body too. Um, you don't want to press too hard with the transducer. Sometimes you can get carried away and, in, 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 and you know, it can cause some pressure on the skin and the kid doesn't like it. And then you're using the other hand here to control the leg. And you can see the way we're set up is basically the scanning plane is going to give you um, long axis relative to the pelvis and the body. And you can imagine that that's actually going to appear like an AP radiograph of a left hip. Here's the same picture without the labels. You just can see what we're doing. Um, sometimes, you know, I can have the parent helping stabilizing the kid, I say like a clamshell, and that's just so the kid doesn't roll around, especially as I'm doing the dynamic part because I want to see what the, what the femur is doing relative to the acetabulum. I don't want the kid rolling all over the place and wiggling. Sometimes if you're having a little trouble finding yourself and getting oriented and, 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 and properly positioned right in the hip, I say, well, just go short axis to the uh, a femur and then just follow it right in. It'll guide you right into it. You have to be ambidextrous. I think it's very cumbersome if you're only going to scan, let's say, with your right hand, and then you have to be cross-handed. So you really should learn how to use both hands, especially when you're doing hips. And another point here is that I'm actually, uh, I am right-handed, so this is my non-dominant hand. And to support it a little bit more, I'm actually resting my my wrist and my forearm on the on the bed, uh, which secures it more. Uh, instead of like you know, my, instead of having my elbows up in the air or anything like that. And I think that's a very important technique. It's also a technique that can be useful if you're doing any inter, uh, sonographic uh, uh, interventional work to kind of stabilize yourself. So, I mentioned that these uh, coronal views can be akin to a AP radiograph. And uh, think of it, so here's an AP radiograph of a pelvis. You rotate it 90 degrees, as you see here, and that really is the view that we would get uh, with that coronal view. And remember the main bang, the, the, the footprint is going to be up here, and this is what you're going to see. And to fix it in your mind, this is really just like an AP radiograph of a left hip turned on its side. And I think that's a concept and that helps you. And usually the residents and that, that are learning, they catch on to this uh, pretty quickly. So here we are with the guide up here. Here's what we see, the ilium, the osseous acetabular roof, the cartilaginous roof. Here's the head. Here's the metaphysis, which is ossified bone, so all the shadowing. And this is the greater trochanter, cartilaginous greater trochanter out here. You take this picture that you're looking at right in front of you, rotate it 90 degrees clockwise, and it will look just like an AP x-ray of a left hip. Now here's one where there's a, things don't kind of set quite right, the same orientation, but notice now the head is, is not down into the acetabulum as much, it's out a little bit. And maybe the roof is a little bit, little bit steeper, it's not, not quite as vertical uh, in, in this picture. Uh, uh, it's a, a bit more of a slope to it. So it's, there's some slight subluxation that we're seeing here. We'll see a few dynamic ones in a moment. Here's one that's even out more. Instead of being down here, it's out here. And this is the uh, cartilaginous acetabular roof. Actually, actually, the cartilage is a bit thickened and echogenic, which uh, often accompany uh, developmental dysplasia of the hip. This one's actually out of the joint. It's dislocated. And you really don't have any recognizable cartilaginous uh, acetabular roof here. Some of this probably is it. It's dysmorphic, very echogenic. This head should be down here. It's hard to say much about the acetabulum because it, it's just hard to see it. But it's a, um, uh, this is a very abnormal hip. Um, when, you're, when it's dislocated, you're seeing two things. You always keep that in mind. You're seeing the unossified femoral head, which should be down here. Here's the osseous acetabular roof and the greater trochanter. And in a moment, uh, we're going to put some extra emphasis on the greater trochanter because it, it can uh, lead you astray in some examples. So this is a, uh, a bit of an immature acetabulum here. And, and especially with graphs work, you, 
you can actually do measurements. You can you try to get this ilium as horizontal as you can on the picture. Use that as a baseline, and then draw a line there along the osseous acetabular roof. And the angle that's here uh, usually should be uh, greater than 60 degrees. Uh, you can measure it. That's the the so-called graph alpha angle. I'm not going into all that. You can read about it. But basically, steep is, is when it's steep, it's bad. It's immature. Now, the short axis is a little harder to picture. And it's basically the baby's in the same position. But now your short axis to the body, you're coming across. And here's a kid that's actually being scanned in the pelvic harness. And this is from Dr. Harkey, and again, he's showing another variation on that. But you can see how your short axis. So what is that akin to, or what is, you know, how do you figure that out? Well, this one takes, I find it takes a little bit longer to get oriented, unless you think of CT scan, because axial CT is shot in this plane going through. So if you think of it that way, the view that you get on sonogram, on sonography, is sort of like a CT. And if you think that way, It'll, it'll help you. And I'll show you. So here's a CT scan of a, actually of a hip. That it's in a cast. You turn it on its side. So this is the anterior, posterior, pubic, ischium, triradial cartilage. There's the head. This is the view that you get on sonography. So whereas the coronal view was like an um, AP radiograph rotated 90 degrees, the transverse view on ultrasound is like an axial CT rotated 90 degrees. And you can see it depicted here. So here's the standard uh, orientation for the CT, rotated 90 degrees here. That's what you see on sonography, and your footprint is out here. And that's posterior, and that's anterior. Now, I've showed the pubic bone in dots because the way the hip is here, the, with it being flexed, uh, you're not going to see it because it's, it's shadowed. Uh, by the uh, metaphysis, the ossified portion of the femur. If you were to bring it out of the screen and going down, then you might, you would see it, but, but I'm showing it like that because usually I have the, the hip flex for the dynamic part of the study. So here's what it looks like. So this picture up here, and here we are here, and here's the head, and this is the ischium, and then this is the, uh, a lot of the, you see a lot of cartilage uh, in this view. Um, if you're interested in acetabular morphology, from that standpoint, you have it's the coronal view that you rely on. This view is very good, though, more for, also for positioning, and I really like it the best for the dynamic study, and we'll, we'll see that in a moment. Anterior, posterior, lateral, orientation like this. If you took this sonogram, rotated it 90 degrees clockwise, it would look like an axial CT of a left hip, just like that posterior, anterior here. This head should be down here a little bit more. It's really kind of up and riding a little bit too much. Now, to go back for a moment to the coronal view, uh, the plane that we've been looking at, it is so-called graphs, the standard plane, the coronal plane, that's, that's really what you want to see to get your morphology. But if you explore a little bit, stay coronal, but slide more posteriorly, this is what you're going to see. All this cartilage that's way, way posteriorly. And that's all the cartilage that we were seeing on the transverse view. Here's the ilium. Here's all this cartilage. You should not see a femoral head in this neighborhood. If you do, it's, it's uh, very much displaced posteriorly. And here's that same cartilage on the short axis, uh, tr transverse view of the hip. And see, it's very posterior. So here it is on this view. The posterior to the femoral head, here it is on this view, and the femoral head is, is not in the plane. It's coming towards us. It's not in the picture. But that's an important thing to be aware of. Another picture of it here with the cartilage, and here's the head. Now, in this baby, actually, if you look down here, these hips are both dislocated. I mean, here's the acetabulum, and here's the head. And... and which you, what we do oftentimes in pediatric radiology, we just imagine looking at the morphology of the ossified bone, we draw in where the head should be, and it would be here, and certainly it should be down here. This is what it looks like on sonography. This is ilium. You don't see anything of the acetabulum because you, you can't get near it because where the hip is. 
and here's the femoral head. So this is, this is completely dislocated laterally and superiorly. Um, when I see this, what I try to do on the exam is I try to see to what extent uh, I, I can reduce the hip. Is it reducible or not? Uh, here's another one on the coronal view, and this is what I was saying. This is that posterior acetabular cartilage, and you have the femoral head right over it, and that's, that's, they shouldn't be anywhere near each other in, this, uh, in the coronal views. And then in the transverse view, again, the head is way out here laterally and posteriorly. This head should be way down here. And here's the ossified metaphysis there. So on this, um, this is a transverse view. This is normal. It's just uh, it's playing over and over again like a loop. And you can see anterior and posterior. This is laterally where we're coming in. Gluteal muscles coming around. Every once in a while you see this little hypochoic hook, which is the greater uh, trochanter. Let me get it going again. Here's the, uh, uh, here's the uh, ischium here and the cartilage over it. And, uh, and this, this is, uh, looks like it's normal. Now, now what we're doing is we are, uh, before I was just going in and out, now I'm actually abducting and adducting. And you can see by the way the, this uh, ossified portion is moving. So when I abduct, I'm moving the hip away from the midline. There it is, ab, now add with a D. Add with a B, add with a D. Now this is important because this is an important part of the, uh, of, of the uh, dynamic examination because hips that are really loose, when you adduct them, and uh, again, I'll show you when it's an adduction. It's adducted now, when, now it's abducted. When they're adducted, they tend to slip. And sometimes the slip is very subtle. It's just widening of this space here between the head and the ischium. And then with abduction, the hips tend to come back in. So abduction, bringing the knee away from the midline, bringing the femur away from the midline, tends to reduce the hip. Adduction with the knee towards the midline uh, tends to uh, cause it to sublux. This is normal. It's going through abduction and adduction, and this distance here in the 6 o'clock position is staying the same. The head's not slipping. You can see how all this normal very posterior cartilage of the acetabulum is coming in and out of the picture. You can see the hook up here of the greater trochanter coming in and out of the picture, and gluteal muscles coming around to and over it. Testing for laxity, the clinicians will do the Barlow maneuver. You push down like a piston. Now in the physical examination, you just feel the one hip going down farther. The leg is going closer towards the bed. We actually watch it on sonography. This is a coronal view, superiors to your left. This is normal. You can see as I'm scanning, uh, uh, the greater trochanter is coming into the picture. Here's the head, a little bit more of the metaphysis, a little bit more posterior. I'm scanning there, and you see more, more cartilage. But this is all uh, normal. This one is, uh, there's some laxity on this coronal view. See right here, this distance is a little wider. See how it's... it's it's kind of slipping out a little bit. Generally, if you drop a line down from the, the horizontal, if you have the ilium horizontal, you drop a line down, about 50% of the head should be medial to that line. So we talk about 50% osseous coverage of the femoral head. This is clearly less than that. Now, the thing is that, yes, there is actually there's some subluxation, but the child is only a day of age. So this could just be normal physiologic laxity, from all of the mom's hormones, uh, which allowed her pelvis to, uh, dis to, um, to expand so she could deliver the baby. Uh, the baby has some of these uh, in him or her, and that's probably what we're seeing here. And after a few weeks, it should firm up. There's another coronal view here. Now, now we're out about a month, and this is one where the hip is, is out. It's perched out here a bit. It should be down here. Here's the acetabulum. And actually what I'm trying to do isn't, isn't to see if it pushes out. Its, its baseline was out. I'm trying to see how well I can reduce it by abducting, and it's not reducing very well here. We've gone to a transverse view now. 
This is the view, if you take this, rotate it 90 degrees clockwise, it would look like an axial CT of a left hip. Anterior, posterior, and I'm just abducting and adducting. Ab, 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 ab. And you can see it's not slipping. There's no widening of the space here. This is all normal in this one week old. This one uh, is a month old. It's that, uh, I think the other one we saw, now it's on transverse view. And, and notice how it's, it's, it's tending to slip out this way. Uh, I can't really get it fully reduced on the ischium. And this is a, a, a lax hip. Now, another view that I use uh, is an anterior approach. Uh, I, it, it gives me a little extra information. It's ancillary. I do not do it instead of the other views. But sometimes I feel it helps me a bit. And here, what I'm doing is just scanning from the front. I tend to use like a, like a more tightly curved one. It's just easier. And uh, you can see how I'm scanning. And uh, there's some investigators in Japan and also in, in uh, I think, Sweden that have done some of this. And um, sometimes it just gives me a, a better, a, another feel for the dynamic study of what's happening. And actually you can see this very, very directly uh, with, with the Barlow maneuvers. The pictures aren't as pretty. Now if you look here, this is exactly like this view. And the bladder would be over here. And, but, but you can kind of make out, you, if you can see here how there's this thunk that's going down. And this is the hip uh, being displaced and dislocated. So this is a good e example of that. And that's what we're seeing. So it's not a substitute. I use it for illustrate, illustrative education confirmation. I always do it at the end of the study because babies sometimes cry with it. And, and there's nothing I'm doing indifferently. To, and it's, I don't think I'm hurting them. I figure maybe they have more cutaneous nerve endings in that part of their body. So they just sense it more than they do if you're just laterally over their thigh. And you got to be careful. It's a great view. You can get peed on very easily. So you have to make sure you keep them covered. The, uh, the parents usually get a good laugh when I check the bladder first. And they know why I'm doing it. So that kind of livens things up a little bit. So uh, in the words of Dr. Harkey here, again, has been one of the foremost investigators. This is some advice he gives about doing it, about doing uh, DDH couple of pitfalls. One real classic one is that it, it, it's hard. You have to get the transducer in exactly the right position. It's very easy. It, it's almost like, like, like a, an airplane. You have roll, pitch, and yaw, and plus translation. So it's really easy to not be in the right plane. And you want to get, as best you can, the ilium to be horizontal. The uh, acid, And you can see, and I'm intentionally uh, going off to show you. But when we get it, you want the osseous acetabular roof to be as deep as you can get it. And um, you want to be able to see the little echogenic uh, fibrocartilage at the tip of the labrum. So there, for that moment, that was the right plane. But you can see in getting to it, you, uh, you have a view here. It looks like you have a very shallow acetabulum. And in the early days of doing this, um, uh, some of our sonographers, and, until they uh, got used to it, were giving us views like this. And uh, then, of course, we go in and then you can, you, you can correct it. Um, one thing I find useful so that you don't fall into that uh, trap is the first view I'll get is this. I'll just have the kid flat on the back, the legs extended like this, and they just come straight in from the side. And it's a very easy view to get. And this was taught to us by, we, uh, by a, 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 a visiting faculty we had for a few years from... Uh, uh, Switzerland, I'll mention in a moment. And, and this is the way they did their screening exams. And my feeling is if you do this and you get a hip that looks pretty normal, I mean, I won't end here, but if it looks pretty normal, and then you go on and turn the kid up and you're getting screwball uh, results and the acetabulum doesn't look normal, it's probably your technique. So uh, the Boris Eckhart is, is the guy that told us about it. So we locally, we just call it the Eckhart view. And there's Dr. Eckhart here with other colleagues uh, from Switzerland who have also spent various time with us. This is our section leader, Dr. Strauss, and that's me at one of the European meetings. Um, another problem you can have is that uh, if the kid has an underlying problem, as you see here, like a contracture, arthrogryposis, these things, uh, they can really throw you off if you don't realize it. And again, it can be a cause of... Uh, 
problems. So this one is kind of classic, and we've had a few instances of it in s some years ago. Um, I'm going to orient again to the, where the greater trochanter is here. And this is a picture. This is when you, it's the plane that you want to be in. There's the greater trochanter. And now I'm intentionally scanning a little bit more posteriorly, a little bit more posteriorly. You really can't see the head now. But if you didn't know where, where you were, what you were doing, you could, you could mistake that perhaps as the femoral head. And sometimes that happens, especially when you can't get the right orientation because there's an underlying anomaly, such as a hip contracture. So this came to mind some years ago, uh, but other places have reported this also. This kid had a fracture there, and there was a concern, you know, where, where is the hip? And you know, where's the femoral head? Now, actually, you're going to see that it's going to be right here. But it wasn't clear. This sonogram was done. It's an old one, but the person reading it couldn't see the acetabulum, saw this, had not seen the radiograph and was not aware of the kid's underlying condition, and then jumped to the conclusion, oh, this is a small dysmorphic um, displaced uh, of femoral head, and the hip is out. They did an orthogram, and the hip wasn't out, and the orthopedic surgeon wasn't too happy. Uh, but that, that really brought to mind that what, the person, that what they were really seeing was the greater trochanter. And this is analogous to this, and this was the case. And this has happened. The last thing, a complication of treatment. Um, babies with DDH can get ischemic necrosis, but it's a complication of treatment, not of the underlying entity. So here's a kid, and, and you can see at this time the hip, and there's kind of a shallowish acetabulum. It's not fully reduced. Here it is on short axis view. This head should be down here more. The kid is placed in a, um, in, in a harness. And Ashley did not have any problems, but I was able to demonstrate what happens. Here the, the hip uh, on this uh, transverse view is adducted. The knee is coming uh, towards the midline. Here's the head and you're seeing Doppler signal within the femoral head. Then I abducted and the, and the signal is gone. Here it is on the movie. So I don't always see this, but it was just, I, I, I was doing this as a teaching example. A deduction, there's flow to the head. A deduction, there isn't. And that's a known uh, a problem. Therefore, when these kids are fitted for the harness, the orthopedic surgeons, there, there's, a, there's a critical zone. They want to be sure that they do not overly abduct the hip. And there's a temptation to do that. You know, they're saying, I'm, you know, I'm going to get these babies in. I'm going to really reduce this. Well, you can overdo it and have too much of a good thing. And then you fall into this problem. And uh, here it is on the coronal view. This is with a deduction, which is actually the, the position with the knee towards the midline where the hip tends to sublux more. And a deduction, see, you've reduced it but at the cost of losing the circulation. So you have to be aware of that. And this is pretty well established in the pediatric orthopedic literature, so they're aware of it. And, uh, and, but but uh, you know, we, we should also, and this just happens to be a, this is an unusually good example of it. So that's why I'm showing it to you. So in summary about DDH, the key concepts are basically it's a ball in a socket. And, uh, and, and then if you understand how the, the coronal view is basically like an AP radiograph turned on its side, and the transverse short axis view is basically like a CT scan turned on its side. I, I think it'll help you out. You have to learn to be ambidextrous, uh, keep your hands on the kid, and cradle a transducer, which is good advice for all of pediatric sonography. And uh, in, that, in this view here that uh, with the patient supine and coming in as a start is a good way to at least get a ballpark figure. And if the hip looks pretty normal then, you should be getting pretty normal results when you turn the kid up, and if you don't, it's probably your technique. And with that, we'll, we'll end this, and thank you very much for your attention.